welcome to uh, the um, joint NDMV and FATE uh, meeting for the autumn. Um, for uh, <laughs> Hugh's waving me into, into position. Um, for those who, who haven't met me already, uh, my name is Phil Cheetal. I'm the coordinator of my death, my decision. Um, this afternoon, uh, the agenda is that we're going to kick off with uh, Celia Kitchinger, who's going to deliver the uh, annual lecture for uh, MDMD. And um, that will be followed at uh, 4 o'clock by our uh, annual general meeting. Um, before uh, we kick off with Celia's talk, can I just ask uh, Jean Parra to uh, stand up? Jean is um, organising our local North London group for, for the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, there's a couple of people who wanted to meet up with her. So uh, this is Jean, so make yourself known to her um, after, after the talk. Uh, okay, so uh, is there anything else I'm supposed to say? Uh, that's right. So, um, I'm really pleased that uh, Celia is able to be with us today. Um, Celia has spoken to us, uh, I think it was two years ago, two and a half years ago, something like that. Um, and she was so good then that we invited her back to do the, um, <laughs> the annual lecture. Um, Celia is Professor of Sociology at University of York. Um, she's a leading authority on advanced decisions and uh, end of life planning. Uh, and she, with uh, Sue uh, Wilkinson, is uh, uh, the, the leaders of a, of a, 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 a charity, a, a, ADA, which is um, Advanced Decision Assistance. And so she said to be very brief, so I hope that's brief enough. That's absolutely Sue. fine, thank you very much. <laughs> delighted to be back here, delighted to have the opportunity to give this talk, um, and hoping to discuss today basically some, some information about advanced decisions, what they are and how to do them, and also think of some policy implications about advanced decisions and their relationship with assisted dying. So I'm a chartered psychologist. I co-direct, and this is how I got into this field, a centre for the study of coma and disorders of consciousness. That's the one thing most of us don't want um, is to be kept alive once we're in a long-term permanent vegetative state or minimally conscious state. I've also recently been working on the British Psychological Society Working Party on end-of-life care, as well as a lot of government-funded research on advanced decisions. And my work in most, many of these areas is jointly with Sue Wilkinson, who founded Advanced Decisions Assistance, the charity that we both work with. Ah, and that's what its logo looks like. Um, and we do a lot of work around um, helping people one-on-one -on -one write advanced decisions. Uh, if you already have an advanced decision, we will look at it with you and um, consider whether you, it still says what you wanted to say and whether it's valid and likely to be applicable. We're increasingly being asked to do training um, in the National Health Service and beyond for wide ranges of groups from GPs, intensivists, clinical psychologists, ambulance staff, hospice, care staff and independent mental capacity advocates. Um, and we also arrange a lot of um, public, public engagement events where we sit in city centres and um, have drop-in clinics for people who are interested in doing advanced decisions, give talks to youth, University of the Third Age or at um, festivals in Dying Awareness Week. So we're pretty involved in this. And before I start, I think two people have already mentioned to me that something appeared in the Times, and I believe earlier in the Daily Mail, saying that all advanced decisions in future would have to go before a judge in court, before um, a doctor could comply with them. Um, this is untrue. This is misinformation. Three letters, including one from the British Medical Association and another from Compassion in Dying, have already gone to the Times to challenge this claim. And um, I don't have many of you on Twitter, but um, it kind of exploded all over Twitter recently, and there's a lot of people saying this is not true. This is from Compassion in Dying. It's been retweeted by Tor Butler Cull, who is a leading barrister in the Court of Protection. There's been some misleading coverage of advanced decisions recently. Please retweet, and that link takes you to 
clear statement that this is not so. So please don't worry. If you have an advanced decision, this doesn't mean that you or your family are going to be called before judges. Um, this is not, not true. So I'm going to talk about these things in this order. And um, depending on how time goes, I might pause for breath between some of these sections to enable feedback and comments, because I don't want to go so fast at such a furious pace that I'm leaving people behind. So I would be happy to have feedback at various points and questions. So I'll start with something basic on what is an advanced decision, and then talk about the right to refuse treatment more generally. Um, I also want to say why, um, although it's not a legal document, I think an advanced statement, a value statement about what you believe is really important as well. Practical information about making your advanced decision effective. And then a question that I'm often asked in groups like this, can I use my advanced decision or my advanced statement to request an assisted death? Some stuff on that. And then thinking forward about um, how, in the context of the current law and social policy around treatment refusal, around advanced decisions, around assisted dying, and around protecting vulnerable adults, we might proceed if we want to develop some kind of social policy that might, at some future point, permit assisted dying for some people under some circumstances. Is that okay? Because that's what I was planning. <laughs> okay, so what is an advanced decision? It's a legally binding way of making decisions about future health care in the event that you lose your capacity to do so in the future. Some of us will never lose capacity, but just in case, it might be a good idea to write down what you would want if you did. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about um, advanced decisions to refuse medical treatments. So those have to be written down and those have to conform to certain guidelines and that's my focus now. They don't necessarily need to be written about things that aren't life-preserving. They're governed by the Mental Capacity Act 2005 and apologies to people from Scotland. I'm going to be talking about the law in England and Wales. It is different in Scotland. I'm going to show you some examples of advanced decisions. Um, three. Here's one that many of my students sign. So this is important if you are younger. My students are in their 20s. This can be important if you have no physical ailments and would actually really like to live for a long time and aren't at all sure under what conditions you would refuse treatment. It basically prevents you from being kept alive if you're in a permanent vegetative state or a minimally conscious state or unconscious for such a duration of time, even if it's not diagnosed as permanent, that you're likely to suffer profound, lasting disabilities such that you can never live independently again. Many young people are keen on this kind of advanced decision, and many people with no other health problems. So it's about as minimal as an advanced decision can be, but I think everybody who doesn't want to be kept alive under those conditions should have one. It says, I refuse all medical treatments aimed at prolonging or artificially <coughs> sustaining my life, including but not limited to clinically assisted nutrition and hydration, that's the feeding tube, because not everybody appreciates that feeding tubes are part of medical treatment. So you're refusing everything, all medical treatments for life-saving things, including the feeding tube, if A, I am persistently unconscious, and have been so for at least four weeks, you can change that number. You can make it one, or ten, or fifty-two. Pick your number. It's a bit arbitrary, whatever you choose, but the more scared you are of being kept alive with profound multiple neurological and physical disabilities, the smaller you want that number to be. <laughs> Sorry, go back. So, I refuse all medical treatments aimed at prolonging or artificially sustaining my life, including but not limited to clinically assisted nutrition and hydration, if A, I am persistently unconscious and have been so for at least, in this case, four weeks, and B, there is little prospect of recovery to a quality of life that I would consider worthwhile, see value statement, in the opinion of at least two appropriately qualified doctors. Recovery is in red. I'll tell you why later. I maintain this request even if my life is shortened as a result. 
It's a pretty basic advanced decision, but it would be valid if it were signed. Um, and if somebody has witnessed your signature, and all the witness is doing is saying, I saw her sign it. They're not saying they agree with you. They're not saying we have capacity. They're not doing anything other than saying, I saw her sign it. And it has to have, all advanced decisions to refuse life prolonging treatment have to have what we call the magic sentence. The sentence which says something like, I maintain this request even if my life is shortened as a result. Now that advanced decision is, would then be valid and it would be applicable if, and only if, you had been persistently unconscious and had been so for at least four weeks, and if two appropriately qualified doctors had decided that there was little prospect of recovery to a quality of life that you would consider worthwhile, and you said in another document what quality of life you would consider worthwhile. So, that's one example. It may not be the one you want, but is, is a, one that lots of people have signed some version of. I want to show you a couple of others. This is an advanced decision, a real one, written by someone who had um, motor neuron disease. And he actually, whoops, he dictated it using a communication board because he was no longer able to use verbal <coughs> spoken language due to a tracheotomy. Mm -hmm. And what he was requesting was removal of his ventilation two weeks after he lost the ability to communicate altogether. So as long as he could communicate by looking at the alphabet board, he, was, he wanted to be kept alive. But once he could no longer do that, once he could no longer speak, communicate with his friends and family, and make his own decisions about his care, he wanted everybody to wait two weeks just in case the skills came back, but failing that, he wanted the ventilator withdrawn. And this is just an extract from a much longer um, statement, but the effect is, in, in the event that my disease progresses to a stage where I'm unable to communicate my needs and lose the ability to have any control over my decisions of care and management, I refuse, and then he's got a list of things he refuses, including, if you look at the end of that paragraph, any life-prolonging treatment, including my peg feet, so he's refusing the lot, but obviously it's the ventilator that would kill him faster. Due to a technical anomaly, that one actually ended up in court, which is why I've got a court reference to it, but it was upheld. Uh, and the technical anomaly was to do with the date on it. It wasn't to do with the wording of the advanced decision itself. So for people who have a known condition, who can think ahead to the kinds of situations that they might be in in the future, and the kinds of deaths they might face, and the kinds of treatments that could be withdrawn earlier on, this is, the way to, this is a way to start thinking about what you might want to refuse and when you might want to refuse it. Obviously, it depends on the condition that you have. So the first one was the most minimal. She was only refusing treatments if she'd been persistently unconscious for four consecutive weeks and if two doctors thought she'd never recover to a quality of life she considered worthwhile. This one's a bit more, more refusing in terms of it will cause death for sure and it's going to happen because he's got motor neuron disease and there will be a point at which he can no longer communicate. So it's a known condition with a known progression and he's refusing a specific set of treatments that will result then in his death. This is another one made by Avril Henry, who I believe was a member of this organization, um, who uh, did not have any life-limiting illnesses. She was a frail older person with no life-limiting illnesses who, hoped to, who was hoping to hasten her own death. Uh, so she wrote, I refuse all medical treatment or procedures aimed at prolonging or artificially sustaining your life. That's pretty global. Everything. Everything. And her version of the magic sentence was, I maintain this refusal of treatment in the hope that my life will be shortened as a result. Actually, we didn't look at the magic sentence in there. Oh, the magic sentence in there is right in the middle, line four, isn't it? I fully understand the implications of the advanced decision and appreciate the consequences and it would put my life at risk. So that magic sentence is about showing that you understand that you will die as a result, or you may die as a result of what you have put in your advanced decision. So Avril Henry was quite clear that she was hoping 
it would end her life sooner. I will come back to Avril Henley's advanced decision later. Um, she actually contacted me about it. I wasn't involved in making her advanced decision, but she contacted me about it because she was in pain and she was using swimming as a way of managing her pain. And she had been told by the um, lifeguards at her local swimming pool that if she had cardiac problems while swimming, they would resuscitate her. And she had given them her advanced decision and said, I don't want to be resuscitated. You can't do this. And they had said, but we have a duty of care. It doesn't apply to us. Our job is to resuscitate and then the ambulance has to take care of this. She phoned me, or us, at Advanced Decisions Assistance to say, is this true? Because if so, I don't think I can go swimming anymore. And we got, actually, Tor Butler Cole, the lawyer who I mentioned earlier, to review the law and write a formal letter to the lifeguards saying, no, it is not true. Everyone is bound by an advanced decision. Volunteers, members of the public, lifeguards, sports people, everyone. You cannot make an exception. So she went on swimming, I believe, until a few days before she died. Some things that advanced decisions are not the same as. This is important because in any group like this, lots of people tell me they have advanced decisions, and I say, show me. And they're not. <laughs> they're just not. Or they're not valid, or they're not applicable. So people quite often produce their do not resuscitate forms. When we're in care homes, people often produce those. Um, do not resuscitate forms have no legal status. They are advisory documents to people who might otherwise resuscitate you. But they do not constitute a legally binding refusal of resuscitation. Some people, depending on which area of the country you're in, will have what are called TEP forms, treatment escalation plans, which are more elaborate versions of do not resuscitate forms that also refuse various other kinds of treatments, antibiotics or um, ventilators. Um, again, these are advisory. They have no, they have legal standing, but they do not, they're not legally binding on the people who are giving treatment. And something called respect forms are just about to be rolled out. They're basically the same as TEP forms, but they've got a fancy new name. They stand for Recommended Summary Plan for End-of-Life Care and Treatment. Notice the word recommended. Recommended does not mean legally binding. Mm -hmm. They're not the same as an advanced statement, which is merely um, a statement of your preferences and wishes that has no legally binding status. They're not the same as advanced care plans, which many people in palliative care have. Advanced care plans are great. They express your views about how you might want to be treated. They cover things like your funeral arrangements, whether you want the dog on the bed as you die, um, the kind of television you might or might not want, the hymns and songs that you enjoy. Um, they're sometimes called things like 20 questions, or um, in Devon they're called My Little Pony Book, because they've got a, a pony on the front. Um, they're not legally binding documents. Uh, they do a lot of good work, but not the same thing as advanced decisions. Um, lasting power of attorney, not the same thing. Um, and m very worryingly from groups like this, I have sometimes been shown things that are labelled advanced directive or power of attorney that come from, so far I've seen them from the Netherlands and from Switzerland. And they purport to give power of attorney to um, an assisted dying organisation and or they purport to give um, binding instructions about the treatment that you want from those organisations. They have no legal status in this country. We are not bound by Swiss or Netherlands law. Um, and because of these titles, I, I find that some people believe that they have protections in this country, and, and they don't. So that's something we really need to be alert to and perhaps warning those organisations about um, that they should be putting information on that says you also need a lasting power of attorney in England and Wales or in Scotland. You also need an advanced decision in England and Wales or advanced directive in Scotland. Uh, so yes, uh, what do I that? Yeah, so, um, crucially, only advanced decisions and powers of attorney drawn up according to the laws of England and Wales are legally binding. Only, they may be binding in Scotland, <laughs> but we're leaving Scotland out um, for now. Um, 
In England and Wales, in order to write an advanced decision, I think everybody here is over 18, so you qualify as eligible, <laughs> you need to have the mental capacity to make the decisions that are in your advanced decision, um, but you are not disqualified by virtue of being depressed, by virtue of being, having mental illnesses of various kinds, early stage dementia, some learning disabilities. People with all of these conditions may be able to make advanced decisions legally if you have the mental capacity to do so. You're not automatically denied the right to do so. And in fact, you're entitled legally to help in doing so. So do not feel that you can't. I occasionally meet people who say, oh, I can't, I've got my dementia diagnosis now. Or, well, I have this, this brain injury from a car accident and I'm sure I, they won't let me now. Um, you don't need a solicitor. You, can, you don't need a standard set form. You can write it out, put the magic sentence in, sign it, get a witness, and it's legally binding. Or you can use a template. If you're going to use a template, I strongly advise uh, com the Compassion in Dying template. It's an online tool. If you hate computers and don't like online tools, get somebody who is computer literate, a son, a daughter, a spouse, somebody who's able to help you fill it in online and that would be great also because you'll have a conversation with them as you're doing it and they'll know what you want which is really helpful um, and at ADA we use case histories as a starting point and then end up kind of filling in, filling in bits of paper for people this is the mydecisions.org.uk online form. It's very thorough, very detailed, um, and it will ensure that you get all the legally binding bits in. <laughs> Things that you might want to refuse um, depend on your current medical conditions and the sort of future that you want and the sorts of values that you live by and want to die by. But I have met people with type 1 diabetes who have a dementia diagnosis, who have written an advanced decision that says from the time when I no longer have the capacity to make the decision to take my insulin, I refuse insulin, which means that they will die from the moment that they have no capacity to decide on insulin. I have met people who have refused dialysis from the moment that they lack capacity. Um, I'm a bit alarmed to have met people writing advanced decisions who still have an implantable cardioverted defibrillator which will restart their heart the moment they begin to die. And they're sitting there telling me they want an advanced decision to refuse treatment. And at some point they go, oh, I've got this funny thing in my chest though, I don't know quite what it does. <laughs> panic. Um, and then other lots of us are on medication that is contributing to keeping us alive. Um, and you might want to think, do I want that when I lose capacity? Or, you know, you're unlikely to come off your hypertension drugs and keel over immediately, but why would you be taking hypertension drugs if you're actually trying to hasten your own death? That does seem a little contradictory. So obviously you want things that make you feel better and comfort treatments, but you don't want any treatments that are designed to keep you alive longer. I'm going to pause briefly to just say, is, is it clear what an advanced decision is and the kinds of things that you can refuse? And is there anything people need to know before I go on to a more general discussion of the right to refuse treatment? Yes? I don't think I've actually written the magic set sentence, but there is a box to tick if you read it. Is that as good? Yes, that's fine. As long as you then have signed the document yes. and had a witness. Did you do the compassionate dying one? Yep. That's fine. I think that's equivalent. Yes. Oh, yes. If you've done the compassionate dying one, you're likely to have got it right. I've seen a few that have got the signature in the wrong place or haven't got a witness, but mostly they, they, they're set up in such a way that they're likely to work. Yes. And when you say do it online, is that how, how then do you get a copy to your shop? You then have to print it out okay. and sign it and then do it. But the whole thing is, it's actually easier to do online for some people anyway, because you, if you just say yes to some questions, you don't then have to go to if yes, down that route, and if no, down that route. So uh, if you can do it online, I would, but you can order it as a PDF instead and download the whole thing and do it that way. But yes, you do need a finally a printed copy. Yes. Um, I noticed in the first section there, it refers to clinically assisted nutrition and hydration. I did. Can, does that extend to food? 
and water. And uh, no, you exclude being fed. You can't exclude oral feeding. Um, it's possible to put in your value statement, which I'll come on to, something like, if I'm not particularly interested in eating and drinking, please don't cajole and persuade and coerce. And I refuse a feeding tube. But you can't refuse oral feeding once you've lost capacity. Once you have capacity, you can. <coughs> yes. Yeah. I've got the article of that lady you've got up on the screen. Oh, have you? Lovely. Yes. And uh, she took her own life with pills she got from Mexico. She did. And said, I will be dead at 7 p.m. She did. And other people, (laughs) the um, police found out the people who got these pills from Mexico and actually raided their houses without, went in without their permission and took whatever pills they could find. Now, that seems... She actually killed herself until the time she would die. Fortunately, I didn't know about her plans at the point that I was advising her about her advance decision, but I did subsequently read the papers and think, oh my God, that's Avril Henry. I've just been speaking to her. Yes, she did. She imported drugs illegally from Mexico, and because that was an illegal act and she had um, drugs on her premises that were unlawful, uh, the police kicked her door down and um, confiscated drugs. And they thought they had all of them, but she divided them into two, and she still had half of them hidden somewhere else, and so she killed herself a few days later. Um, One thing to note about that is that they did try to argue that she lacked capacity to make the decision, that she was a vulnerable person, and they got psychologists in, I think it was psychologists, they got some kind of professional in to examine her, to find out whether they could invoke the law on safeguarding adults, and they found that she had full capacity to make her own decisions. That's really important. With your own decisions, you can't break the law, obviously, but it's within the law to kill yourself, albeit not with illegally imported drugs. I'm going to move on now. I can see some other facts, but there's going to be so much. Um, I've promised to finish at 3.30, so I will continue. Okay, so the right to refuse treatment um, depends on your mental capacity. If you've got the mental capacity to make the decision to refuse treatment, you have an absolute right to refuse any treatment at all. If you don't have the mental capacity to make the decision, then if you don't have an advanced decision, the decision is made by other people, and it's made in your best interests. So, with mental capacity, which probably applies to everybody in this room right now, you are the decision maker. You have the legal right to refuse treatment for any reason, or for no reason at all, and you have the legal right to make unwise decisions, which no doubt many people thought is what Avril Henry did, an unwise decision to kill herself. But we often make unwise decisions, right? We speak with the wrong people, we eat the wrong foods, we drink too much. That is something we all have the right to do. Killing ourselves is a rather more extreme one, um, but it is not unlawful, and it is within the rights of people with capacity to do. People may also refuse treatment that would have kept them alive so that they die. And we hear that all the time. People just say, I've had enough chemo. I want to live my last months to the full without the side effects. I'm going to refuse it. I'm going, there was a granny, wasn't there, who went on a world tour um, instead of having her last three months of chemo. It was a wonderful story. Um, And you have the legal right to kill yourself, but not with illegal drugs and not with... if anyone who assists you then commits a criminal offence. So it's pretty important for us to know what is mental capacity, right? Because if we've got it, we've got all of these rights, and if we don't, it turns out we haven't. So it is defined in the Mental Capacity Act, and it's defined as the ability to understand, retain, and weigh information relevant to the decision. And those are really lay terms. Nobody's trying to bamboozle us with something sophisticated here. Doctors, GPs, every time you go to your GP, he or she is assessing your capacity because you can't give consent for things if you haven't got capacity. Um, So understand, do you understand that if I give you these antibiotics, there might be these side effects and you should take them this often and this this frequency? That's understanding. Retaining is, how many did I say you should take every day? Three. Yes, 
good. <laughs> and weighing is, well, I think they'll help you with this chest infection, but there are some side effects. It's up to you to consider the pros and cons of taking this medication and to decide. If you can do that in relation to a decision, you have the capacity to make it. And obviously some decisions are much easier to understand, retain and weigh than others. So many people will have the capacity to make decisions about what to have for breakfast, but not about where to invest their money. Many people have the capacity to make decisions about what game they'd like to play, bridge or poker, without having the capacity to decide whether they should end their lives or not. So capacity is, is not all or nothing. It's decision specific. And when we are considering whether somebody has capacity, we're not just saying you do and you don't. We're saying for this decision, do you have the capacity to understand, retain and weigh the information? It can be lost permanently. Many of us will permanently lose the capacity to make all or virtually all decisions for ourselves. Obviously, if you're in a vegetative state, permanently unconscious, no decision-making power at all, no capacity. As dementia advances, end-stage dementia, you are going to lose the capacity to make virtually all decisions. But often it's temporary, so you will lose capacity if you faint. While you're unconscious, you might come round again ten minutes later, but while you've fainted, you've lost capacity. Also, while you're anaesthetised for surgery or something, you've lost capacity. So, any decisions that we make concerning treatments we want to refuse when we lose capacity have to take into account that capacity is decision-specific and capacity can be lost either permanently or temporarily. It can also fluctuate. So I think we all know that when we're very stressed, we might lose the capacity to make certain decisions. I sometimes resort to, I don't know, I can't decide. It's too difficult to ask me tomorrow. Um, or if you drink too much or you're just exhausted or you're just overwhelmed, you might lose for that moment or that day the capacity. But the next day, after you've calmed down, thought about it rationally, had something to eat, got over the hangover, you can make the decision. You have the capacity to understand, retain, and weigh the information. Fluctuating capacity is actually quite common with dementia and, and also with some mental illnesses. So the task is to help people make decisions at the point when they do have capacity. The law says that we should presume that people have mental capacity unless there is evidence that they don't. We do not have to prove to anyone that we have mental capacity. They have to prove that we don't. And the law is quite clear, and when I say the law, I mean both the legislation and judges in the Court of Protection have been really, really clear that you can have mental capacity to make very serious medical decisions, including about refusing treatments that will kill you, sorry, that, that would have kept you alive so that you die, even if you have, and these are from real cases, schizophrenia, Paranoid schizophrenic was allowed to refuse treatment that would, they thought, have saved his life. Alcoholism. Anorexia. Anorexics have been allowed to refuse feeding tubes. Some have, some haven't. Um, other mental illnesses of different kinds. And in the early stages of dementia. So the bar for loss of capacity is actually quite high. It is not an, a, a, a low bar. You have to, for people to prove that you have lost capacity which is what they have to do. They have to show that you cannot retain and understand and weigh the pros and cons of decisions. And they, it's the, the, the onus is on them to prove that you can't, not on us to prove that we can. And if there's some doubt about your capacity, or if it's fluctuating, you are legally entitled to help to ensure that you get the information in a form that you can take it in, in small bits, in easy language, at the right time of day, that you are helped to make a capacitous decision. This is good law. I like it. <laughs> um, so the classic case that people always cite um, was in 2002, a 43-year-old paralyzed from the neck down, refused a ventilator. It went to court because people didn't want to remove the ventilator from her. And the court established the absolute right of a patient with capacity to refuse treatment, irrespective of the consequences of that decision. And she died, of course. 
Um, so there was an argument about her capacity. She clearly did have capacity. And then Sparkle, I meant to look up and I didn't get round to. But um, the was this what's her name, Miss C? Miss C. Okay, so a, wo a woman who's known in the courts as Miss C decided she wanted to refuse dialysis because life had lost its sparkle. <laughs> she was in her 50s, she was no longer young and attractive, uh, she felt that you know, life wasn't as good as it had been, um, she loved fashion and clothing and she was no longer kind of living life in the way that she wanted to. The judge clearly disliked her a very great deal, thought she was superficial, shallow and selfish. She also had teenage children. Um, but respected her right to make the decision. He thought it was an unwise decision, he thought it was a selfish and, and horrible decision, but she had the right to make it. That's, that's the power of having the right to refuse treatment with capacity. So I've recently been involved in a consultation with British Psychological Society, um, and I've spoken to more than 50 psychologists involved in end-of-life care. And psychologists are amongst the people who are consulted about your capacity. Do not be afraid. Psychologists, psychologists are actually very good at assessing capacity where it's in doubt and facilitating it where it can be brought, where, where capacity can be achieved with the right kind of treatment. So people tend to get referred to psychologists for capacity assessment when they refuse treatment. Uh, because doctors are really scared. This person's refusing treatment and, and so they might die. And they get sent to psychologists with the instruction, either find that they haven't got capacity so we can make them have treatment in their best interests, or just talk some sense into them. <laughs> Psychologists don't like this. Psychologists feel that they are the non-medical member of the multidisciplinary team and that what they're interested in is in working with the patient to live life the way that they want to until the end on their own terms and to facilitate their autonomy, not to coerce them into anything. So psychologists do end up working with these patients, P is the patient, to help them think through decisions and to assess the costs and benefits. They end up working with multidisciplinary teams sometimes to improve the kind of treatment that the person is getting. Because sometimes people are saying they don't want the treatment, or indeed they want to go to Dignitas, because they're not getting the right kind of care. And that's very frequent. And psychologists can intervene with the multidisciplinary team and say, in one story it was, this person needs a fridge in her room. The care home is only providing margarine. She wants butter. Provide her with a little pink fridge in her room and go to the supermarket and buy butter and she will find life worth living again. And you know what she did? <laughs> she did. And for the last few weeks of her life, that made an enormous difference. Um, and this was someone who was desperate and miserable. Um, that psychologists also find themselves managing the relationship between the patient and the multidisciplinary team, with multidisciplinary teams sometimes very angry with the patient for refusing you know, the, the magic bullet that will treat them, um, or feeling helpless that they went into medicine in order to cure people, in order to give people medical treatment, and here's this damn woman who's refusing it. And that's horrible for the, for, the, for the medical profession, and psychologists can help them come to terms with the fact that sometimes their treatments aren't wanted, and that they need to deal with their anger, and they need to deal with their distress, and they need not to take it out on the patient. And those are very important roles. Two-thirds of the psychologists that I spoke with had experience of working with people who said they wanted to go to Dignitas or end their lives. These are psychologists all working in end-of-life care. This contrasts with the fact that they virtually none had any experience in advanced decisions. That was very rare. But I want to go to Dignitas, my life is so miserable, I want to kill myself was very common. So, clinical psychologist in palliative care said Dignitas is an issue that comes up fairly frequently in our palliative care team. It's something I've been asked about maybe four or five times in the last couple of years to support the team when a patient has been thinking of, well, it's not always as formal as Dignitas, but ending their own life. We currently have a couple who are both poorly and want, who are both poorly and want to die together. Working acute care. Working with older adults, I'm very aware that the generational cohort has changed over the last 10 years. 
the previous generation was the World War II generation, and they'd learned to put up, shut up, and get on with it. <laughs> Older adults now are people who grew up in a very different kind of society, and they have expectations about their end-of-life care, and they want to meet them. And if they can't, then they want to do something about it. Care home liaison psychologist. Certainly I see people who want it to be over, but they're not like actively suicidal. It's more like, I know I'm dying and it's getting a bit drawn out. I hear things like, you wouldn't treat a dog like this. When people are coming to the end of life and make a comment about dignitas, that's often their way of drawing attention to the fact that the current situation they're in is intolerable for some reason. And psychologists can do something about that. People say, this is somebody who works in hospice, people say this life is intolerable. Adding, and adding, so I'm pursuing the idea of dignitas, is a way of conveying how badly they're feeling. If you shut it down right away, that would be really unhelpful. Many psychologists talked about how providing better palliative care, or indeed improving the conditions in which people are living, meant that people were no longer wanting to go to dignitas. That wasn't necessarily their intention to stop people going or stop people ending their lives, but they are very committed to making life as good as it can be for people at the end of life. Um, and they also talked about how people talking about ending their own lives was about control and about wanting to insist on choices. Many also said they didn't see it in the same category as suicide. Uh, so the second quote here, I do feel there's a significant difference between suicide and assisted dying. I'm just talking about a particular patient. It's not that she's not wanting to live. It's that she's not wanting the death she's going to have with this illness. Mm -hmm. Many psychologists commented that the whole stuff about safeguarding vulnerable adults felt inappropriate in this context. Not very helpful. But patients talking about dignitas don't fit comfortably into the role of a vulnerable adult. I felt he had full capacity to reflect on his choices and understand what was on offer. And he weighed it and decided, not now, but later. And that was his informed choice. That's talking about someone with cancer. But the medical team suffer. The most painful thing for the medical team who were dealing with one patient was that they were devastated that after all their input and support, he still wanted to go. They felt they'd all done their best, and he was telling them it wasn't good enough. It was experienced as a failure on their part. They were saying, but we will look after him. We will be there for him. We will do our very best. We had to talk about how it wasn't a failure of the palliative medical team. It was just that some people want the control to be with them. And certainty is very important to them. <coughs> the psychologists that seem to me to be doing a good job of managing the relationship between the medical team and the patient who is wanting either to refuse treatment or simply for their life now to be over. If you don't have mental capacity to make a decision at the time it needs to be made, then unless you have an advanced decision, a best interest decision will be made by someone else. That person will be a doctor or, a mem or your clinical team, not family member or next of kin. There is next of kin do not have the legal right to make decisions on behalf of you. Uh, it can, however, be someone that you choose instead of the doctor if you have a lasting power of attorney. For health and welfare, there are two kinds. Many, many people have the one for finance. Very few people have the one for health and welfare. You need both. You really need both. So that was about decision making. The point about an advanced decision is that when you have capacity, you have the right to make all these decisions. You lose them unless you have an advanced decision, which gives you the right to refuse treatment in advance of losing mental capacity. So for people who care about personal autonomy, personal decision making, if you want to be the one to make the decision for yourself, an advanced decision is the answer. It's not for everyone. A disadvantage is you haven't got a crystal ball. You don't know what will be happening in the future. It might be better if you have someone that you trust and whose views you respect and who knows will make decisions in your best interest to appoint someone else. You can actually do that as well. But an advanced decision is the right thing for people for whom personal autonomy is completely crucial. So that's why I was talking about the right to refuse treatment, both 
at the time and in the future. And I'm about to say why an advanced value statement is important, but I saw someone putting her hand up. I just wanted to ask if you please, um, if, if you've got your advanced decision or your um, lasting powers of attorney all done, yes, you have the first thing. What if then it comes to it and you don't have capacity? Would they try and... Uh, so if you make your lasting power attorney yes, right. and right. your advanced decision yeah. when you have mental capacity, yeah. those only come into operation when you lose capacity. Yeah. Until then, you make your own decisions. Yeah, but if then uh, at the end you don't have capacity, will they try and argue with that and ignore... You're making these documents for when you don't have capacity. Yeah. Um, so they, there should not be any argument once you've lost capacity because that's what the documents are for. <laughs> They're precisely for when you lose capacity. And you want to avoid people arguing backwards from the fact that, oh, you've got advanced dementia now. Does that mean you might have written the advanced decision with dementia? Does that mean you don't have capacity? I'll say a little bit about that in um, section four, making your advanced decision effective. Yes. Just another quick question. I got an advanced decision. I subsequently did a lasting power of attorney. Right. Does that overrule the advanced decision? Which, for further information, I re signed after doing the LPA. Yes. Unless you put a proviso in your... So, so the question was, what's the relationship if you make an um, advanced decision and then subsequently appoint someone to, as your lasting power of attorney for health and welfare? If you give that person the right to make decisions over life and death issues... I don't know if you've done that. There's a little box to tick. It's optional. But if you've done that... And if your advanced decision also made your own decisions about life and death decisions, what's the doctor supposed to do? Either it's you who's made them in your living will, your advanced decision, or it's the person you've appointed. And what if they disagree? So the law says whichever one is most recent wins. But does the signature say I've reviewed this advanced decision and it's still valid? Made after the LPA? Yes, but I think I'm pretty sure that would override your... Yes. That, this is quite a sophisticated question about the relationship between two documents, and I could look at both of them and advise you. It's also not actually the date you make it, it's the date it gets registered with the Office of the Public Guardians. So it's an even more complicated. But if you've got both, I'll have a look at them later. Okay. Okay, why you want to do a value statement as well? Loads of people don't do value statements. I think that's a big mistake. Um, a value statement, remember that word in red, recovery? Recovery to doctors tends to mean being a bit better than you are now. You've recovered. That's not what it means to most of us. We mean getting back to normal, getting back to where we were, or almost, or at least for some of us it means that. And you need to say what you mean by recovery, and the value statement is a great place to do that. It's also an opportunity to express your values and beliefs, to kind of introduce yourself to this doctor you haven't met yet, and say, here's who I am. Here's what I care about. Here's what I believe in. Most doctors want to provide person-centered care, but if you don't tell them who you are as a person, they can't. It can be used to explain why you've made the decisions that you have, which is quite persuasive. Doctors that I've done, spoken to in training don't much like tick boxes. Like, if somebody's just ticked a lot of boxes, it doesn't convince them that you've thought about it or that you've, ex that you've considered the various pros and cons of things. So they like to know something about, perhaps surprisingly, they quite like a page or two about you know, your hobbies, the things you've done in your life, that you enjoy travelling or, or knitting or books you've enjoyed or bits of quotes from poetry. Or, you know, they like to know who you are. Um, they're persuasive, and that's a legal term, that the document can be persuasive, even if it's not legally binding. It's also a great place to say thank you. Uh, a, an intensivist I once showed my advanced decision a few years ago said he wasn't going to comply with it. I'm not for resuscitation. And he said, I will resuscitate you. And I said, why? And amongst his reasons was, well, you haven't said please don't and thank you for not doing it. And you haven't acknowledged how painful it will be for me to watch you collapse and not use my skills. So, first of all, please and thank you are not legally required, but they're awfully persuasive, apparently, and I rewrote my last decision, and it has please and thank you. 
things that you might say about what you mean by recovery, I mean a return to normal independent living, or if you're less demanding, I just want to be able to recognize my family and friends and take pleasure from their company. Uh, here's another real one. I don't want to be left without what I call quality of life. I can't imagine anything worse than not being able to do what I do now. I hate even being stuck indoors. I do the lunches, I do stroke club, I do befriending. I see a lot of people with disabilities, and I could imagine living with a certain level of disability, but if I'd also lost capacity to make my own decisions, then I'd be impaired in a way I wouldn't want. So you feel you sort of know something about her, that you feel better about not giving treatments because this was how she was expressing her views. Another one, independence, autonomy, and intellectual competence and making my own choices are very important to me. I fear pain, confusion, and powerlessness far more than I fear death. I do not wish those I love to become full-time carers. If I cannot meet them with emotional and mental engagement and recognition, I would want them to go forward with their lives with joy. And this is Avril Henry's. My long, happy, productive life is more than complete. Aged 80, I now live alone in incurable, unbearable pain, which cannot be relieved by opiates, which render me dangerously dopey and incapable, and with crippling and progressive disabilities. My registration for assisted dying at a Swiss centre has been a lengthy, difficult progress for more than 10 months. However, my death in the UK is vastly preferable and would be welcome. So this was in her advanced decision as I saw it. Um, and her death in the, my death in the UK would be vastly preferable and would be welcome, enabling me to avoid, and there were some bullet points, further of unavoidable physical deterioration. I can barely care for myself already. A long, painful, difficult, very expensive journey. And then there was a list of other things, and it ended up with Swiss cremation, of which I do not approve on ecological grounds. <laughs> also, my green burial in my own orchard is all legally arranged and prepaid with my undertaker. <laughs> she was extremely indignant at having, as she thought at that point when, when, when she and I were emailing, um, that, of having to go to Switzerland, um, which was what I she, she could see from her advanced decision she was planning, and I, I didn't know about the illegal drug in, the drugs being imported I just said, <laughs> yeah, fine I'll just help you with your advanced decision thing but um, she was also a retired university professor so we got on rather well complaining about the state of universities today <laughs> um, so that's why I think an advanced decision is important, you get a sense of a person and even though you're laughing at Avril Henry you can hear who she was, right she comes across as the sort of person that she was, you know why she made the choices that she did and that's important for doctors who are charged with not giving treatments, actually. A quick nip through making your advanced decision effective. Um, ensure that it is valid and likely to be applicable. Um, and consider its relationship with your lasting power of attorney, uh, which you may need some help with. Um, you need to be sure that you're refusing what you, in fact, mean to refuse. Uh, so lots of people have advanced decisions that refuse the permanent vegetative state. Many do not also include that they want to refuse the minimally conscious state. Although when I talk to people, they figure, oh yeah, yeah, no, that sounds even worse. I want to refuse that as well. So yeah, it's worth just chatting through with somebody what it is that you want and don't want. And reviewing it, you know, as you see things, and I write, rewrite mine once a year. Um, I've got a little thing in my calendar that comes up to reconsider advanced decision now and every time I rewrite it that, that I go back to it and think, why did I say that? No, no! And I, I do make changes to my advanced decision every year. Um, so just change it if you change your mind. You should also change it if you change your circumstances. Um, pregnancy is often cited. Um, but religious affiliation is another reason why you might want to change it. Um, you know, things happen and people think, oh, would she really still think that, given this change in her life. Do discuss your advanced decision with your GP and with any medical specialist you're involved with. And if there is any possible doubt about your mental capacity at the point that you're making your advanced decision, if, for example, you do already have a dementia diagnosis or you have some other kind of mental illness, even, you know, something like anxiety or panic attacks, clearly, obviously, if it's depression, get a statement of capacity. And anyone should be able to do that. A GP should be able to do that. It doesn't require anything more than somebody sitting down with you and saying, um, why have you written this? What are you refusing? Why are you refusing it? Have you considered the pros and cons? Tell me what they are. 
there isn't a central register for advanced decisions for complicated problems to do with the way the National Health Service is organised and the failure of computer systems nationwide. Um, so you do need to get it on your GP notes, but you need probably to walk around with a hard copy and keep handing it to people. By people, I don't just mean medical specialists, family, friends, neighbours. My trainer at my gym, my personal trainer, has a copy. My dentist has a copy. Anywhere, anyone who might be there when I collapse suddenly needs to know that I don't want to be resuscitated. Um, I, there's a copy in my car. Um, I have a... Do people know the lion's message in a bottle scheme? So there's a little... You get them free, a little green and white tube, lives in the fridge, has something saying, my advanced decision is top left-hand drawer. Also available on my computer. You can access it like this. Uh, this is a jewellery you can buy that says to people, whoops, here's one. Uh, paramedics really like jewellery that hangs over your heart if you're, if you're not for CPR. Do not put it on your wrist. They're not looking at your wrist. They, they need something that's going to be visible in the place that, that they need to look at. Um, revisit before elective surgery, obviously. Um, if, you're refusing, if you're refusing resuscitation, but you're going in for an operation, you're going to lose capacity during, during the an, uh, anesthesia. Consider whether that's what you want. Um, make sure if you're not for resuscitation that your local ambulance service has got you on their register. Um, and there are different systems in different countries where, oh, that's the lines in the bottle scheme, it's a little green and white thing. Tattoos are not legal. I mean, somebody will look at a tattoo and just go, well, nah. who knows why that's there. Might have done it 20 years ago for a drunken dare. So quite a few people have shown me their tattoos, um, and I just go, well, I don't think the paramedics are going to respond well to that, and, and indeed they don't. There are, though, other ways that you can make advanced value statements, not the legally binding bit that has to be written down, but all of the stuff about here's who I am as a person and here's why I think what I think. You can make a video or audio recording of you. And it's easy. You can just do it on your mobile phone, often in conversation with somebody, where you say, well, here's what's in my advanced decision and here's why I said what I said. And that person can maybe challenge you a bit and say, yeah, but what if... Or surely you don't want to starve and dehydrate to death without a feeding tube. Or, but mum, I miss you, please stay. I don't want you to die. And I know that, but it's my life and it's my decision. With that kind of thing on a video is very compelling, should you ever be in that situation in the future. It also could encourage you to have that conversation and film it with your, with your loved ones. Um, some people use art or poetry. I've seen poems in, adv in, in advanced statements. Um, and also... Keeping a, making visible through the way that you live your life what your values and commitments are in a way that other people have access to is really important. So as an academic, I write articles about autonomy, freedom to choose, my right to refuse treatment. There's a really good record for me um, of my values, wishes and beliefs that is very publicly available. I've also put my own advanced decision up on a website where anybody can access it as a public resource. So I feel like I've documented my values, wishes and beliefs in a very public way. But you may do that in other ways. You may do that by your membership of this organisation being publicly available to people. Your campaigning for assisted dying. Your membership of faith communities through which you express values and commitments about autonomy um, or your, your rights not to have your being called to Jesus or whatever interfered with. So there are ways in which your values, wishes and beliefs can be expressed in ways that courts will consider important, should it ever get to court, and doctors would consider helpful if they're having to make decisions about you. So it is not all about producing legally binding documents, it's about expressing yourself in other ways <coughs> as well. Brief pause if anybody's got... Yes. I now have realised that the order and the decision I launched with my GP four years ago is definitely not valid. Oh dear. <laughs> when I present him with a new version, okay, hopefully he will decide I have mental capacity, but if he thinks that uh, I have put in uh, fairly 
advanced form of refusal of treatment. Is he entitled to tell me, I don't want to put this on your records? Okay, so the question is, can a GP look at your advanced decision, decide that, yeah, you've, you've got, got mental capacity, capacity to make it, but I do but not want it on your records? Yes. Um, I don't know of such a case having been decided by a court of law, but I suggest that if your GP ever were to do that, that you change GP, because you do have the legal right under the Medical Capacity Act to make an advanced decision to refuse treatment, yes. and if your GP doesn't want to be involved, I'm kind of sympathetic to some GPs of faith and of particular kinds of values who really don't, in the same way that I am for doctors who don't want to be involved in abortion. I would just say, say that you respect his right to his own freedom of belief and move on to another GP. Ask to be referred to a GP who will put it on your records. He has already declined to let me have a DNR form. So you need another GP. Mm. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Another question. I just want to say you'll have great difficulty getting hospitals and people like that to accept your advance decision. I mean, I know that from my own mother. When you say accept, how do you mean? Well, they don't want to know about it. You can wave it in their face. I mean, I, I went in for an operation and mm. I'm a, a, you know, full anaesthetic. I don't have a DNR. In mm. the unlikely event, this is it. Oh, the next man who comes along will have to deal with that. Oh, the, I mean, I got, I got oh the operation theatre on the trolley, still waving it, and no one would touch it. <laughs> so that was a do not attempt resuscitation? That was no, it, was my, uh, it was my complete oh, advance decision. Oh, the complete advance decision. Which includes, which oh, includes do not attempt resuscitation. Okay, I've had mixed experiences, mm -hmm. and I guess we all do, depending yeah. on which medical professionals you happen to be involved with. Um, I went through a lot of medical interactions with my mother, who, who died last year, and people were regularly engaged with her. So w during the consenting process for surgery, she produced her advanced decision to refuse treatment, and also her lasting power of attorney, which appoints my sister, appointed my sister as attorney. And those were taken very seriously and lodged on her records. Um, certainly I've had experiences of handling things over, um, what was the last thing I went for? Um, a flu jab, and they just laughed. <laughs> um, well, people do have allergic reactions to flu jabs and, and collapse, so, so I do think there is some variability, but the point remains that you have the legal right to refuse treatment, and doctors who give you treatment when you have given them, shown them that you have an advanced decision to refuse it, are technically committing assault and battery against you. Nobody's yet sued any doctor for that yet, but it will come. Yes? Can I ask you, how often do you have to revalidate your You don't ever have to revalidate. In, in, under the law of England and Wales, if you've got one from 1980, it's it's if it happened to comply with the law of 2005, which is unlikely, yes. it would still be valid. Um, they are valid until proved otherwise. Because um, um, one's told to, that you should redate updates. Yes, again, that's to make them persuasive. Because doctors looking at an advanced decision made in 2005 today are going to think, oh, maybe you changed your mind. Why would I pay attention to that? So it's not a legal requirement, but it's a requirement to make your advanced decision persuasive that you should do that. And I would strongly recommend that you do it. About how often? Well, I do mine once a year, but I would also do it if something dramatic happened. If I got a diagnosis, for example, um, of something that I haven't got at the moment, or if I got married or divorced, or trying to think of other circumstances. So I would, I would consider seriously doing it. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next section, although I can see some hands. Hold it. Um, can, you use your, can I use my advanced decision or advanced statement to request an assisted death? No. <laughs> Why not? Well, because as we all know, an assisted death is not lawful in the UK. So, and that does include Scotland, so you just can't. Um, but even if an assisted death were lawful in England and Wales, you wouldn't be able to use an advanced decision to request one because by law, current law, an advanced decision, as defined in the Mental Capacity Act 2005, is about treatment refusal. You're refusing treatment, not requesting it. You cannot use an advanced decision to demand specific treatments, let alone a treatment, otherwise known as poison, to be injected into you. <laughs> um, so the answer is simply, straightforwardly, no. 
Mm, you cannot, and there would also, even considering the possibility, there is no chance that an assisted dying bill could possibly become law any time in the next century or so that includes a, a, an assisted death for someone who cannot at the time request it or consent to it. So remember that an advanced decision is for after you have lost capacity. So to say, after I've lost capacity, please inject me with a lethal substance, <laughs> even if it were legal to be injected with a lethal substance, would be completely beyond the pale. Yes, no, but this is the good bit. You can indicate in your advance value statement that this is something you might want, if it were legal. Um, I would put it in a value statement quite separately from your advance decision. Uh, so as not to confuse people. Keep the legal bit that you can enforce by law, what, one place, and then the, here's where I'm as a person and here's, who the values, here's the values that I have somewhere else. So um, you could say, I would like to record my wish for an assisted death if this is lawful at the point that my advanced decision comes into effect. I don't think in our lifetimes it will be, but it does tell doctors something about you, doesn't it? And your likely views about dying. I would rather die swiftly from treatment that is given to end my life than die more slowly from withdrawal of life-sustaining treatments. So you can, of course, refuse life-sustaining treatments like the feeding tube, which will mean that you die over two or three weeks, but you can't request the lethal injection. But you can say something about that. You can also indicate that you are willing, even eager, to accept sedation and pain relief at the end of your life, even at the risk of shortening your life. It's a bit of a green light. My mother did that. This is my mother. And her very inadequate, now looking back at it, living will, which she signed in 2012, which begins, if the time comes when I can no longer take part in decisions for my own future, I want to receive whatever quantity of drugs will keep me free from pain or distress, even if death is hastened. That shouldn't be in an advanced decision. It's an advanced statement. It's a it's a request for treatment, but it was jolly helpful when she was dying to be able to say, I think she might be in pain, could we have some more morphine please? This is what she would want, look. And the fact that it's not legally binding doesn't matter. It's an important signal. And in fact it did help, it did help a lot. You can also state explicitly in your advance statement that your advance decision is designed to cover suicide attempts by you. Suicide is lawful. If you don't succeed, or somebody comes upon you before it succeeded, do you want them jumping up and down on your chest and pumping out your stomach and trying to resuscitate you? If you don't, then you can say that in your advance decision and say that your advance decision is to apply even if the suicide attempt is the cause of you being in the situation where you lack capacity. Because the statement that does that, this advanced decision to refuse treatment, is intended to apply even if the condition that makes it relevant is a suicide attempt on my part. To be clear, I specifically refuse the treatment specified if I lack capacity to make my own decisions following an attempt to end my own life. That's lawful. There are pros and cons of all of this, though, and I discuss these with people when they want to put them into their advanced decisions. It's up to you, obviously. You might not want it to apply under these situations. The advantage is it makes your values and beliefs very clear to the person who is reading your advanced decision and your advanced statement, and it may alleviate the doctor's concerns about giving medication that might result in your death in order to relieve pain. It might mean you get more pain relief. Um, which I think for people who've seen loved ones suffering at the end of life and not being given adequate pain relief because the doctors are so scared that it might accidentally shorten their life, that's really important to send that signal. And it, will, and it does help doctors to feel potentially that they're protected by the law. On the other hand, it can cause some alarm amongst healthcare professionals about how their actions might be interpreted if they know that everybody knows that you want an assisted death and they've just given you an extra dose of morphine and whoops, you've died. Yes, but he didn't intend it, honest. So it does rather make very apparent and on the surface um, a possible suspicion about what medication is being given for and how 
that would be understood by other people. It can also leave healthcare professionals feeling that they are implicated in your suicide or have assisted your suicide in some way. And that's a rotten feeling for them, some of them, many of them. So it is mixed benefits. I think, as to whether you want to be explicit about that or not. And I want to end with some thoughts about developing policy on the France decisions in assisted dying. It seems to me that a lot of the concerns about advanced decisions that were expressed during the process of passing them into law and that have been expressed subsequently by many healthcare professionals are very similar to the sorts of concerns people express about assisted dying. They say, for example, about advanced decisions, that it might discourage palliative care and rehabilitation. We just withdraw treatment and let you die instead of providing you with high quality care and pain relief that might make your life more bearable. They say that advanced decisions might mean that people are refusing treatment very early when actually their prognosis might be that they live much longer than doctors think that they will live and could indeed recover some of the capacity that they have lost. They worry that your wishes at the time you wrote the advanced decision were not actually what you wanted. They worry that you might have not have actual capacity at the time that you wrote the advanced decision, or that somebody bullied you into writing an advanced decision, the evil relatives who want to inherit your property. They're concerned that older people will write advanced decisions refusing treatment because they're worried about being a burden either to their children or to the NHS, the cost of treatment at the end of life. They worry that by the time the advanced decision becomes valid, when you've lost capacity, you might have changed your mind. And now it's kind of stuck in stone that you refused these treatments a year ago in a situation that you didn't have a crystal ball for, and now you're in this situation, you seem quite happy, and yet you've refused antibiotics, intravenous antibiotics for your lung infection with dementia. And now you don't have the capacity to make that decision, but you've refused the treatment in this written document. And that's quite upsetting for the happy, demented patient who then doesn't get the antibiotic treatment because the person she was a year ago refused it. They worry about advanced decisions being used as kind of backdoor suicide or backdoor assisted suicide. They worry about their role of, as doctors and their commitment by the Hippocratic Oath to curing people and valuing the sanctity of life. They want to opt out, some doctors, of having to withdraw, especially withdraw treatment because of their own values and beliefs. These map really very closely onto the concerns that are also expressed about assisted dying, that it will discourage good palliative care and rehab. That how do we know that somebody's going to be dead in six months? So the requirement of the failed Maris Bill in September last year was that you had to be within six months of death before you could apply. But actually some people who get a diagnosis in six months go on to live for much longer. Um, so I know this organisation has now got a policy that says forget the six months, it could be any time. But there are uncertainties um, and those uncertainties are the same for advanced decisions as they are for assisted dying and yet one is lawful and the other is not. They worry that when you make a request for assisted dying you might not have mental capacity, that you've been coerced into it by your evil relatives and that you're concerned about being a burden. These are very familiar, right? That by the time your death is happened you may not anymore want it, that you have changed your mind with experience. They believe that it's suicide and there was a big argument about whether the bill was called assisted dying or assisted suicide. They worry about the role of doctors, the Hippocratic Oath, they want conscientious objection. The single most important aspect, um, other than the six month period, that resulted in the defeat of the assisted dying bill last year was concern about vulnerable people. Um, as the Care Not Killing campaign said, the right to die 
conservatively become the duty to die. And I went through the Hansard debate and saw quote after quote after quote of MPs expressing concern about vulnerable people. They'll be pressured to take their own life, they'll feel they're becoming a burden to their family or society, they'll be emotionally blackmailed so as not to become a financial or care burden on their loved ones. We, we shouldn't be making it easier to kill people. We need societal change to prevent people from feeling a burden in their elderly years, said Ian Fox, opposing. <laughs> on the other side, Sarah Champion said that she did not doubt that there were evil relatives out there who will seek to coerce their elderly mother. But she believed the safeguards were in place because that elderly mother will then have to persuade two doctors and a judge that this is her choice. I do not think that someone who is vulnerable enough to be coerced by their evil relatives could persuade a judge that they are taking such action from their own choice. Now that argument was lost um, in Parliament. We, we didn't get the assisted dying bill. And it, we didn't get it because neither side, neither those proposing the bill nor those challenging it engage with the fact that we already have an enormous edifice in place for protecting vulnerable people. Decades of experience in health and social care and two acts now, the Mental Capacity Act from 2005 and the Care Act which specifically is designed to protect quote vulnerable adults unquote. The definition of the vulnerable adult goes back to 1997 and is a person who is or may be in need of community care services by reason of disability, age or illness. So that's going to be most of us at some point. And is or may be unable to take care or unable to protect him or herself against significant harm or exploitation. In effect, this means that any one of us who might want to choose an assisted death or kill ourselves is going to be classifiable as a vulnerable adult using that definition. We're likely to be old or disabled or ill, which is why we want to end our lives, and we're likely to be perceived as possibly unable to protect ourselves against the harm or exploitation of anyone who might assist our dying. These vulnerable adults, though, or already have in place a vast tranche of support services. The Care Act 2014 gives social workers and others, including psychologists, access to vulnerable adults. They can come into your home, they can demand access, and they are particularly concerned about those who are under constraint, this is from the Act, or subject to coercion or undue influence, and therefore unable to exercise free choice or to give and express a real and genuine consent. And their task under the CARE Act is not to stop you doing what you want to do, not to overrule your wishes, but to ensure that you're making your choices freely, not under duress, not because somebody is making you. I believe that as an organisation campaigning for assisted dying, any organisation campaigning for assisted dying needs to build on and develop the existing expertise that health and social care professionals have in working on issues of mental capacity and vulnerability and to use that to ensure that vulnerable people are protected in any future legislation. I do not think we should go down the route of demanding that all of us prove that we have capacity or prove that we're not under coercion that we're making autonomous decisions. That should be the default presumption. And that is what the Mental Capacity Act says, that we should presume that we all have capacity. And that where, when, where it's in doubt, people should be facilitating our capacity, including our right with capacity to make decisions that other people don't like, find unwise or even morally repugnant. We should be using the expertise that already exists to develop that kind of protection. And if that expertise exists among psychologists, a whole class of people who are developed solely to protect it, called independent mental capacity advocates, social workers, judges are excellent at this. They have the experience in assessing mental capacity, in deciding whether somebody's acting freely or under coercion, in facilitating people's ability to understand the information to remember it, to weigh up the pros and cons, and to balance the risks and the harms that people are exposing them to. 
I think in terms of protecting vulnerable people, while also extending choices to everyone, we need to build on what already exists and develop that um, as part of the way forward. Thank you. Questions. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, so, dude, I was going to say th thank you incredibly much. So, that was a fantastic talk. Um, oh, nice. I thought I understood a lot of these things, but I, I learned an awful lot from your talk. So, uh, especially the last section, I think uh, we were talking about this over lunch. And I think it really is uh, um, very pleasing, from my point of view, to, to, to see a way forward for trying to find new ways of protecting vulnerable people. I think it is a risk. Um, we do need to work towards it from both sides. So thank you for seeing okay. the point in that. In the red shirt. <laughs> um, uh, again, relevant to the last section, this raises a uh, question on my part, which is, you mentioned this past and that you were an, an intensivist. Could you say something about um, how that came to be legitimised your training over and above, obviously, what you revealed to you? To ourselves today. Uh, I'm not sure I get the question. I, I, I would refer to an intensivist who didn't want to ac accept my advanced decision. Oh, right. I thought you referred to it as a role that you adopted. No, no. Intensivist was a guy who works in intensive care resuscitating people and right. he objected to my refusal to be resuscitated. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. How should I have made copious notes of things on the screen? I didn't. Is there any way I can... Get the PowerPoint slides? Yes. I will give you the... Can I, I'll tidy up the PowerPoint slides. I saw a few typos, but then I will pass them over to anyone who wants to have them. That, that's brilliant. If, if, if you give me the slides, I'll put them on the website. Thank you. That would be fine. I'm looking for people who haven't had the chance to speak yet. I was yes. I, I think one thing to bear in mind is more about advanced decisions than their boxes. And when you go to the hospital, they will not want to know. It's an added complication. All the pressures on them are to ignore it. There are some doctors who would say, openly say they'd rather go to prison than a by an advanced decision that will shorten life. You want, until you get the cases whereby people are taken either to the GNC or to the courts because of not abiding by a well written advanced decision, these will have very little value. So the message people here have to have is you've got to fight, fight, fight. And if you don't fight, and if you see that relative who dies really miserably and in pain, ignoring an advanced decision, the instinctive thing is to say, I don't want to know anymore. What you have to do is to fight. And I can't say that too strongly, but at the moment, in the political so the concern is that doc many doctors will ignore these and will in fact have ethical objections to them. I think that's true. I think there are also many doctors, I know there are many doctors who welcome them because they believe they went into medicine not to save life at all costs but in order to make people's lives better for them and they want to deliver person-centred care. I, I'm trying now to cooperate with doctors rather than fight them and to understand what their problems are and we do a lot of training with doctors. If you come across doctors who are saying I'd rather go to prison than, than follow an advanced direct decision or I'm ignoring it, um, can you try and get the, them involved in training? So contact us and let us know where they come from and we will contact the CCG or the hospital and we will try and support some training because they are willing to get some training um, and they're just scared about the implications at the moment. Yes. And as we can't trust the doctors and other people, shouldn't the society be fighting for a central register? Well, uh, Compassion in Dying is already um, arguing for a central register and has put together various proposals. Um, the, the, the block at the moment is actually not ideological or political. It's simply that the NHS computers don't talk to each other, which is very depressing. But um, until we sort out the IT systems, that's not going to happen. But yes, it would be great to add this organisation's voice to that of Compassion to Dying as a really crucial development. 
Yes. I'm not quite confused because one idea was to make you say it's legally binding, but on the other hand, you talk quite a lot about things having to be persuasive. <laughs> yes, I've lost in that. Okay, so, so the question is you talked about legally, things being legally binding, but you also talked about needing to persuade. This comes in part from the observation, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, that many doctors are hostile to or uh, or don't want to engage with, they have busy lives, advanced decisions. Um, so that something can be legally, how often have you driven over the speed limit, okay? Not everything that's legally required is adhered to, and advanced decisions are certainly amongst those. Um, doctors are ignorant about them, doctors are fearful of them, doctors may never have seen one before. So there's something about needing to persuade doctors that they matter. Moreover, I've seen doctors who have felt bullied by advanced decisions into behaving in ways that they think are unethical. And I would like doctors to feel that an advanced decision is a message from me to you at a time when I can't speak. Please do this because. So that I'm not bullying them, although legally I guess I am, but also trying to explain to them why. So yes, it's legally binding, but I'm using a carrot as well as a stick. Yes. I just wanted to uh, warn um, how long it can take the public guardian to register uh, your documents. We spent nearly ten months. Oof. It should take six weeks, but ten months is bad. Is that because it got sent back a few times? Yes. Uh, yeah. So if you, fill in, if you don't fill in the form right and you haven't got the right signatures in the right box, they send it back and you have to do it all over again and they take your money again now as well. So this is about lasting power of attorney, which um, is not legal until it is registered with the Office of the Public Guardian. They say it takes six weeks. It can do if you've got it all right and done and sorted in the first place, but they quite often come back because people haven't filled them in correctly. And that's appointing somebody else to make decisions on your behalf. Um, so, yeah, an advanced decision doesn't need to go through that process. Yes? I have some good news on that. I've just done my um, LPA to have it sent back and forth and so many times that they said, would you like to involve yourself in research on the newer, <laughs> simpler, online version? Oh they are completely rehashing them. They've rehashed it several times. Yes, yeah, it's got a lot easier over the last few years already. Then is your attorney, you are the donor of what yes. you don't know. The terminology is extremely difficult. Yes. And I'm happy to say it's going to be it, it has actually improved over the years. Um, uh, in principle, you should be able to do your appointment. When you say one, did you have both finance and yes. health and welfare? Yeah, so you've got two, not one. Yeah. So this box that you almost need to check this or this, apparently. Yes. So, so you should be able to do your lasting power of attorney yourself online, at least with the help of somebody who is computer literate. Um, in fact, it's quite complicated, but solicitors do charge. Does anyone have a recent estimate for what a solicitor charges? 300, 400? And that's for one, right? So if you do two, you're talking about 800,000 pounds. And if you're a couple and each of you are doing it, you're talking kind of around 2,000. They're quite expensive. If you just do it online, all you need to do is pay for the registration, which is 150. 150? 140? 130? It's much less. But you do run the risk of getting it sent back several times. That is the catch. Okay, they are very good on the phone. They are very good on the phone. Yes, very helpful. Yes, I've heard that. Okay, I'm aware that we're out of time and we should have a tea break, but I will be around during the tea break, so I will be happy to chat to people. Thank you very much. So, thank you.